like to introduce myself. I'm Trey Kaliba, a Principal Cloud Architect at Global Payments. And I'm uh, Jim Hatcher. I'm a Solutions Architect at Cockroach Labs. Thanks. And we're going to be talking today about setting new standards for reliability in cloud native applications. So kind of first, let's set the stage of kind of a little bit what we do and why we do it. Um, so reliable payment processing is obviously fundamental to the global economy. So how many people today use their credit card or use their phone to like tap something, you know, or, you know, yeah, so it will pretty much everybody, right? Um, so whether it's your, you know, you're tapping, swiping, dipping the card, tapping your phone, this happens all day, every day. And it, it really is a fundamental part of the economy today. One of the things that, that I like to think about is it's very much like a utility. Um, one of those things that when it's not, it's great, and then you don't really notice it until it's not there. And you know, when we look at this, it's, it's, it's very much that important, right? If we have a huge outage, um, it can affect not just our clients, not just us, it can actually affect the entire economy. So who are we? So Global Payments, we have about 5 million merchant accounts, um, have about 38 countries where we have, where we have a physical presence, um, and we do about 75 billion transactions annually. Um, about 27,000 employees worldwide. We're based out of Atlanta, um, but we obviously have offices all over the world. Um, Fortune 500 company, so if you've never heard of us, that's okay. Um, but I guarantee you, if you've used your credit card in the past you know, week, you've, we've probably touched your, touched your payment information. So our unique challenges, um, kind of want to get into a little bit of what, what is, goes into a payment authorization, because it helps to understand what our, what our challenges are. So if you're a customer, right, you go to a merchant, whether it's Starbucks, whether it's, you know, e-commerse, e um, you're going you're gonna to pay them. You're going to tap your card. You're going to click a link. That's going to go to a, what we call a payment gateway. That payment gateway is going to handle the routing and the authorization of that transaction. Um, that authorization is going to hit um, an issuing bank. It's going to hit a card brand like Visa or MasterCard. Um, and those things are, you know, all have to happen very quickly. So when we look at the payment gateway itself is the primary application we're going to talk about today. We've got to have a very low latency for what that application does because we have to worry about all these downstream things, right? Our payment gateway may live in a region in you know, US East and GCP or US Central, um, but then it has to go to potentially Atlanta and a data center and then go to Visa or MasterCard. So we've got to make sure we maintain that low latency. And what we aim for from our payment gateway is a round trip of under a second. Um, it's one of those funny things when I got into the payment industry, I never noticed how long a credit card, credit card swipe took. And uh, one of my bosses at the time said, you know, notice, start, start paying attention. And if you start paying attention, you notice. Sometimes it's like, that was really long, or man, that was really fast. Um, but obviously, when we do this right, we have a high amount of throughput as well. So the payment gateway that we're gonna talk about today, um, we aim for about 250 transactions per second. Um, while we're doing that, we have a lot of things we have to worry about. We have to worry about stringent security and compliance standards, things like PCI. Uh, and this is to protect your sensitive financial data. And these regulations are evolving constantly to match the, you know, the threat actors that are out there. Uh, we need to make sure we have global operations uh, to ensure you know, this seamless, reliable payment system around different regions of the world. And ultimately, really, we need 24-7 availability. Because we are a global company, because we work with clients all over the world, um, we don't get the luxury of any downtime, really. You know, there are always things that are happening within our systems. And then obviously, um, you know, the technology landscape is constantly evolving. You know, think about even five or six years ago, you know, tap to pay wasn't a thing. Well, it is now. So we have to be able to kind of meet that. We have to look at those, those new technologies because our customers ultimately expect us to be able to do that. So the application we're talking about today uh, is a le legacy application. Uh, runs currently, you know, before our modernization, ran on a fleet of VMs, lived in a data center, uh, ran on a legacy database. But what kind of limitations do we have with that, right? So obviously scalability. Um, legacy applications struggle to handle increasing volume and user growth. With our data centers, right, you may have to go purchase new hardware and install the hardware. Those things can't happen quickly. Uh, we need to have, again, availability and resilience. Our existing infrastructure lacked those robust mechanisms that we want for high availability and disaster recovery. Compliance, again, these evolving regulatory and especially nowadays data sovereignty where certain areas of the world want to make sure their data stays in their part of the world. So they need to live in a certain data center. They need to live in a certain region. Um, those can require a lot of manual processes to, from a compliance standpoint um, and a lot of operational overhead to make sure that those things work correctly. And obviously with our legacy applications that live on legacy hardware, um, don't really lend themselves very easily to 
rapid development, right? We want to be able to deploy new features quickly. We want to be able to run good testing um, in good development environments that we can scale up. So we want to make sure that, you know, when we look at our legacy applications, this is something we want to make sure we can address. So the team that I'm on now is a cloud transformation team. And so one of the things that we've been tasked with is, is coming up with methodologies that we can use, that we can distribute to our developers and to our operations teams to do their jobs better. So there's a couple, four, four kind of key tenets that we follow. Um, number one, all right, microservice architectures, this has been around for a while. Um, but we really wanna make sure we decouple our services for agility, scalability, um, and make sure that those services are independently deployable. Uh, we want to make sure we have a DevOps culture. So this obviously helps accelerate this transformation process because we want to bring together collaboration with our development teams, with our operations teams, um, and make sure that we can, we can provide automation to them and, and continuously improve on what we're doing. Obviously, containerization is very big. Uh, we want to leverage containers for app, not only application, but for database as well. And we'll get into that in a little bit. We want to make sure we have consistent deployments and, you know, Containerized applications running on Kubernetes obviously help us optimize for resource utilization. One of the things our applications struggle with is they can't scale down. They're just on big fat hardware somewhere. And you know, when we have that, when we do have slower times, we want to make sure we can scale down to meet that. And then obviously making sure we have good integration with our cloud provider services. So uh, we're, we use Google Cloud for this application, um, but we want to make sure we can utilize those cloud native services and utilize the enhanced functionality that comes along with that. Um, this also can help us from an efficiency perspective, where if we utilize some cloud native tooling that the cloud provider gives us, that means that's less operational overhead for our teams. So we'll kind of take that and apply that to a blueprint for like a high level for this application. There's a couple of things we're gonna look at. Um, we're gonna utilize GKE with multi-region deployments for what we've kind of started to call pervasive high availability and get away from the term of disaster recovery and go to disaster avoidance. So if we can never have a problem, that's kind of the, you know, that's the gold. That's our golden, that's the gold star we want to achieve for, right? Um, to help do that, we're using um, container native load balancing. So this is load balancing in GCP that actually lets the load, load balancer become aware of the pods in the cluster. So we're going to be able to dynamically distribute that traffic across multiple regions, which obviously helps us optimize for efficiency, gives us that scalability, and then ultimately gives us that resiliency so we can survive things like regional outages. Uh, we have heavily utilize GK Enterprise, um, especially the new fleet management features. So we use fleet management, really helps us simplify our cluster management across all these fleets, and also helps us from an automated onboarding standpoint. So we have heavily use uh, Config Sync, um, we use things like enable cloud service mesh through that fleet. So when we, you know, for example, run a Terraform deployment, we can stand up a cluster. These other things happen automatically, which again, from an operational standpoint, makes things very, very simple. And then Cockroach, uh, Cockroach DB, it provides this foundation for consistent, scalable, fault tolerant transactions across all these regions. We have from a multi-regional ingress and deployment, uh, again, GKE multi-cluster ingress, which helps simplify the management of all these multiple regions. Uh, we get, when you do multi-cluster ingress, you end up with a global IP that's an AnyCast IP address and gives us a way to automate, automatically route traffic to any of these regions through one entry point. Um, our legacy system today uses a lot of, you know, regional IPs for each one, and then we do that through DNS. But so a little bit of a new concept, right, just to have one IP address, um, but again, allows us to control where that traffic goes and, you know, ultimately, helps us leverage things that Google's very good at, right? Distributing global traffic. Again, our multi-regional clusters help us protect against regional outages uh, and improve the performance for our global users. Um, through, this global, through this global IP address, right? You get the point of presence all across the world. Um, and then we can send our traffic over Google's backbone, which no surprise is very efficient and very fast. And then ultimately, again, our data residency requirements um, it helps us leverage, again, our GKE multi-regional deployments to ensure that we can stay within that compliance in things like data sovereignty. So Jim's gonna talk a little bit about CockroachDB. Yeah, so I'll introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jim Hatcher. I'm a solutions engineer with Cockroach Labs. I've been with Cockroach Labs about four years and um, maybe two years ago, started working with uh, Trey and other folks at Global Payments and kind of got to come alongside them and understand this cloud transformation journey they were going through and kind of see how Cockroach DB could align with what they're doing. Uh, I like to think Trey and I have a strange and wonderful relationship. 
uh, he's strange and I'm wonderful. <laughs> and uh, no, but it, it really has been a fun, fun uh, journey together with these guys. So uh, I'll just give you a little bit of flavor about what Cockroach DB is and kind of how it fits into global payments uh, infrastructure. So uh, I think you can think about Cockroach DB as kind of the, the best of both worlds or all three worlds between a relational database, a NoSQL database, and like a cloud native database. So uh, just to elaborate on that, we, we are a relational uh, engine. When, when you talk to Cockroach, you do, you do so with a Postgres driver. So it feels like you're just talking to a Postgres database. We speak all the Postgres SQL. Um, uh, and you know, we do joins and we do foreign keys and use the same data model in Cockroach that you use in Postgres. So uh, where we're a little different, um, uh, like how many folks in here use relational databases as part of their everyday job? Great. Okay, so uh, you know, like a relational database, typically the way that works is you get one great big server, you try to cram as much uh, vCPUs in there as you can, as much memory as you can, get the fastest disks you can, uh, and then you model your data, uh, maybe in third normal form, uh, you know, very kind of normalized model, or maybe you denormalize a little bit for performance, but when, when you write a piece of data into that server, it lives in one place on that server. Uh, and you know, if you need to get that data back out, maybe you join some tables together to get that one value out. Um, and so, uh, so Cockroach is fundament, fundamentally different in that, at that, in that way, in that we, when you write a piece of data into Cockroach, we create three replicas of the data. And so, uh, we, but we're strongly consistent. The way we keep those three replicas uh, exactly consistent with each other is uh, the Raft protocol, which is a distributed consensus protocol. It's used in other projects, um, uh, including some projects in, in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, so yeah, so we use that Raft protocol. So we have three copies. So, um, so one nice thing about having three copies of the data is that uh, you, you can have a three node cockroach cluster. If, if one of the nodes goes down, you still have two of the replicas available. And as long as we have a quorum, we can still serve reads and writes. So, uh, so you can take a node down for for, un, for plan maintenance, uh, you know, patch it, do, you know, upgrade a version or something, bring it back up, and your you know your application doesn't even feel it. So that that's where we get some of our resiliency from, just the fact that we have these multiple copies. Uh, and it, and so that's kind of one big difference between rel typical relational database. Sec second way we're different than normal relational database is that we scale horizontally. So. What I mean by that is uh, if you have Postgres and you want to make it bigger because you have a larger workload or you have more data, you, you know, you put that on a bigger box. You need, you know, more CPUs, more memory. So at some point you'll hit a scale ceiling where I just can't get a bigger box. But with a horizontal scaling model, you can add more and more and more nodes. So you could have a three, three cluster node that goes to four or five, you know, 10,000 nodes. And so you don't have a ceiling. So that, you know, this, the, the way you can scale it, you know, is, is very large. So. That's, that's the general idea with Cockroach. So I like to say we're, we're, we, we work like Postgres, we scale like NoSQL, uh, and we're also a very cloud native database. So we, we can run very well in Kubernetes. We don't have to run in Kubernetes, but we're, we're a single executable, well, a lot like kubectl or kubeadmin tool, you know, it's like one big file that you download, and that's very easy to containerize, very easy to, to run in a containerized way. Uh, and and we, can, we can take advantage of the cloud because we had that horizontal scaling model. So you, know, you can scale from three to 10 nodes and go back to three nodes. And so you, it, it's a way to really leverage the cloud in, in a way that the cloud is meant to be leveraged. So, so that's kind of what Cockroach is. Um, I think you know, some of the things that Cockroach brings to the table, especially in relation to like what Global Payments is trying to do. Um, so because we have this distributed uh, architecture in our DNA, uh, we can also run in multi-region. So if you take you know, the several nodes in a cockroach cluster and you just put them in different parts of the world, uh, maybe US and Europe and APAC, um, we, we can run in that way uh, out of the box. We don't need like another replication tool or another add-on. Um, and when we run in that multi-region way, we're active-active or active-active-active. There's many, many regions as you want to have. We're active of all of those. Um, so this is nice for like what, what Portico is trying to do. Um, their, their legacy solution was like an active passive. So they were, they were all pushed into one, one data center. And if that one went down, they could fail over to the other one. Uh, but in this new model, they're, they're actually pushing uh, data to, to two regions all the time. And if one of them goes down, then they can shift all the traffic to one side through the smart load balancing. Uh, but anyways, so you kind of get active, active out of the box, which is nice. And then, uh, 
you know, we, you know, horizontal scaling is just the typical way that we scale. So um, you can add a node. When you add a node, the cluster sees it, says, oh, I've got some extra capacity. Let me start moving some data over there. And it just, you know, it's just kind of seamless, seamless scaling. And kind of one last piece that, that's really kind of cool about Cockroach is the ability to do data domiciling. So if you have a cluster in US and Europe and Asia and you need to be GDPR compliant where all your European data needs to stay in Europe, um, you can run a simple DDL statement to, to apply a configuration to make sure certain rows in a table only stay on the European nodes or certain databases, all the tables stay on certain nodes. So that's a nice uh, feature. So, um, so this is a, a little peek at how, how this runs uh, within global payments. So um, global payments, they, they run in uh, Google Cloud, uh, GCP. Uh, they run um, in three different regions. So they have uh, US West, US East, and uh, uh, US Central is the third region. And they, um, they actually route traffic to two of these regions. And that third region, uh, it could take traffic if they wanted to, but it, it really just kind of acts as like a witness region. Uh, where it's, for, it's like a third point of, uh, like it's like a tiebreaker so we can have quorum. Um, but you know, each one of these uh, regions can, can scale, um, you know, bigger, smaller, you can, we can scale up or down, we can scale out and back in. Uh, so uh, you know, because it's distributed, uh, we're able to scale and not have a single point of failure. We don't have to take the system down to scale. You know, it's just, you start scaling and the workload continues to run. Uh, we have automatic replication. That's not like a, another process you have to monitor. It's not like a bolt-on you have to put in the system. It just happens automatically. Um, we have uh, survivability. There's an idea in Cockroach. You, you kind of pick the topology that gives you the survivability you want. So this is a topology that gives us regional survivability. So we can lose any one of these regions due to a GCP outage or some network problem, uh, and we're still able to, to, to handle reads and writes. And, uh, when the other region comes back up, we recover and we just keep keep chugging. Um, the automatic failover. This is a lot of this has to do with how the load balancing was set up. But um, you know, if we're routing traffic to US East and US East goes down, it'll automatically fail over to US West. And because it's active active, you're not worried about oh, do I need to manually fail over or what was my RPO or my RTO? You know, just it just happens, and and all that happens with strong consistency. And when I say strong consistency, what I mean is when you write a piece of data into the database and you immediately read it back, you always get the value you wrote. So you can imagine like in a payment gateway, they do uh, some duplicate checks to make sure you're not like swiping your card twice. So you know, if, one, if one of your transactions gets routed to US East, the next one gets routed to US West, and, and they don't know about each other immediately, that's a problem. So uh, in Cockroach, when you write to US West and, and you get an acknowledgment, anywhere you read, you're gonna get the, that same data back. So. Um, you know, we have, so we have that, um, that strong consistency. Anywhere, any of these regions that you read from, you get, you get immediate strong consistency. So, so that's uh, kind of the, the foundation. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Talk a little bit about, so what, what we're doing specific to GKE with Cockroach. Um, so originally when we deployed Cockroach, we deployed on VMs, um, a great solution. Um, but we said, no, we want to run this on Kubernetes. And we actually had some folks internally that said, you cannot run databases on Kubernetes. And we said, watch us try. Um, and, and it was really a, it was one of those things that we, we, it was a hypothesis. We were going to test it out and we're going to come back with data to, to kind of back up what we thought was there. So um, right now, like I said, Cockroach is deployed currently in three regions. Uh, we're planning for five uh, to expand out to. But then, yeah, we kind of had some of this, G, I call it some GCP sugar we sprinkled on top, some little extra features that we get through GCP and GKE um, that really provided this extremely resilient solution. Um, but yeah, one of the ones that was kind of interesting was using cloud DNS for GKE. Um, this is where uh, you're, you know, typically you'd have cube DNS inside the cluster. Um, cloud DNS for GKE allows, again, cloud DNS to take that. Uh, typically, when you deploy Cockroach multi-regionally, you have to go inside of each cluster and let it let it know how to contact the other clusters and where those are. Um, but using, using this, right, we can just leverage what's natively there inside of GCP and that handles it for us. Um, the other thing. This one on. No, nobody needs to hear me talk anymore anyway. Cool. Yeah. All right. So rewind a little bit. Um, yeah. So we expose Cockroach uh, regionally through in, uh, internal load balancers. 
each one of those load balancers can um, then hook into cloud DNS through health checking. So actually in cloud DNS, we'll tap into the health checks on the ILB. And what this allows us to do is not only to talk to Cockroach through, whether it's through Kubernetes or you know, through the app that's in Kubernetes, um, but also as a, has, provides two other use cases for us. So we do have some VMs that still wanna talk to the system, uh, whether those are reporting VMs um, or we actually have a proxy VM that we utilize identity aware proxy for, so our, our uh, database administrators can have a different way to get into the cockroach cluster. But again, we can leverage cloud DNS for that. And you know, when a re if a region has an issue, um, it'll just pull it out of, from cloud DNS, uses that health checks, and, and we just continue on as normal. Um, some separate things that we do in GKE as well is we put this on a separate node pool, and that's for performance requirements. Uh, one of the main things is um, Cockroach really wants higher clock speeds, so we make sure that we provide hardware that has those higher clock speed CPUs. Uh, obviously, we use SSD persistent disk for our boot disks, um, and then we also use premium RWO storage class for um, our persistent volumes. Uh, and then we use also GVNIC, which if you're not using, you should be using on GKE, but it's an improved network driver um, that, again, gets additional performance. Um, so after we kind of deployed this, what was our result? Well, uh, from our testing, uh, we achieved a 380% system capacity increase um, with minimal impacts to latency. So latency went up a little bit, but that's to be expected because our rights are now going to three different regions. Um, a lot of our devs are like, well, can we get that a little bit lower? And said, well, if you can invent wormholes or time travel <laughs> or, you know, some kind of way we can break the speed of light, maybe we can make that happen, but not going to happen here. But yeah, so again, a minimal increase in latency and just a dramatic increase in the number of transactions per second. Um, I think we were, you know, our, a lot of our senior managers, our senior vice presidents that are above this, above this application, were kind of blown away. Like we got, you know, we got an email back when we did this testing of like a bunch of emojis with the head exploding. And uh, it really was, it was pretty mind blowing that we could, we could achieve that. Um, Oh, and I'll, I guess I'll, one other thing I'll quick mention is, and the solution was cheaper because we're not running fleets of giant VMs that sit there consuming nothing. Uh, so yeah, another big benefit. Um, uh, from a reliability standpoint, um, so we run, f you know, we were able to run 15 plus chaos experiments. Um, so this included container and pod deletes, CPU memory hogs, node failures, network interruptions, simulated regional outages, and we still maintained 100% system uptime, which was, again, pretty incredible. I know Jim, Jim and I were on this call. Uh, we initially did this through some, just some ad hoc chaos testing, right? And we, between our engineers and their engineers, uh, we, we struggled to break it. We, we, we tried, we couldn't do it, which again, was pretty incredible. Um, from impacts, from upgrades. So being able to run transactions and do a, cock, do a full upgrade of the day, you know, of Cockroach itself, do schema changes. Um, but again, zero impacts, right? We could still run our full transactions we're running through um, with no issue. So, um, and yeah, note here on chaos, one of the things we're trying to get to is some automation. So we'll be using harness for that. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about it in a second. But so building on our success here, um, you know, what, what's next for this, right? So obviously we had tremendous results. Um, everybody was very pleased, but what can we do, right? So we wanna expand and extend. So obviously we mentioned, we wanna bring this to some additional regions. Um, you know, we have a couple of key clients in different parts of the world. Well, now we have a system where we can quickly spin them up infrastructure that puts it close to them and gets that, you know, all the big features that they, they wanna get. Um, but also, you know, exploring, um, you know, hybrid cloud capabilities, whether it's a hybrid cloud with on-prem or, you know, multi-cloud and, and a different cloud provider is that extra little piece. I know Jim talked about, you know, we're really pushing that five nines, um, but you know, even going even further, um, when you kind of go to another provider, another, you know, that you can start to achieve that. Um, we wanna bring this as a platform, as a service to our developers. So we want to be able to build this where I'm a dev, I can deploy up my own little cockroach server, which I mean, they can do locally, um, but really we want them to work in the same environment. And so, um, Part, as a platform, that's one of the things that we're working on is where they, their, their development envir environment exactly mirrors what's gonna be in production. Like I said, um, so bringing some of that chaos testing, we're using, like I said, we're utilizing Harness, but we wanna automate this same chaos testing as part of our application deployments and schema changes. It's not something we have now, but would give a lot um, of confidence to new deployments, to, to application code changes, if we can run that full suite. And again, to see this resiliency um, as we make those, you know, updates to our code. And then obviously, you know, continuous innovation. So one of the things we really enjoy about GCP is that it changes a lot. That can be a good and bad thing sometimes. Uh, it, it, it changes very frequently. And I think there are new features every day. Um, but obviously with 
with the way the system works now, with the application being microservices, the way we're deploying things, uh, we can really take advantage of those newer features as they come available um, much more than we could before. So with that, thank you all very much. Uh, it was very nice to talk to everybody. And there's a little QR code if you want to give us a survey and let us know how you did. And I think we have some time for some questions. There's a microphone, but if you if you want to yell me yell the question, I can repeat it for you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you go ahead. Well, yeah. So a lot of the technologies you described were native to uh, GCP. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you could have accomplished the same thing on other clouds? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think our my philosophy with how we've approached this is. We're going to, this, you know, we have a deal, like, we're going to be in GCP, right? And so why not take advantage of what they can do for us? Um, you know, there are some things, right? So we use, like I said, we mentioned config sync, right? So we use config sync for our cluster configurations. Uh, what's really nice about that is, again, as we stand up a cluster, that's just part of our Terraform code that gets hooked in and automatically configures. Um, you know, we've talked about maybe we need Argo CD at some point. So what, what we've said is, let's, let's work with this until we get to a pain point where we have that need. And then... I feel like we're in such a we're in a good position where we are that we have good portability. Um, you know, for our builds, right? We use Cloud Build. Um, so again, each one of those build steps is a part of a container. And so as long as we kind of remember that when we're doing this, how would we potentially port this? Um, yeah. So I think we can get that on multi on any kind of cloud. But uh, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of any cloud provider you're in to utilize as much as you can. Yeah. Uh, how much storage uh, do you handle in the Corroge cluster? Uh, the first question. How much what? How much storage oh. use between the clusters? Yeah, and, and, and when you're sizing a cockroach cluster. In, in, global, in, in the global payments case use. Okay, yeah. The question was how, how much storage can you handle in the cockroach cluster, and specifically in global payments? So, so uh, the metric we use for sizing is for every uh, vCPU in your in the machine, we can handle about um, 320 gigs of storage. So these are 16 uh, vCPU machines, and I think there's five per region. So uh, do the math on that, but uh, it's around you know four or five terabytes, I think. Um, but you, you know if you if you need to add more storage, you just add more nodes, and each each node provides some compute, and each node provides some storage. Okay, um, the other question is when you use the chaos experiments when a region is down, how do you handle the transaction in flights with eventual consistency? Yeah, so how do we, uh, how do we when we run in chaos, chaos experiments, how do we handle, uh, how, how do we run that and what, how does the availability work? Is that right? Okay, and did you test the replication lag between regions uh, of the uh, data replication? Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'll answer. I'll answer. I'll start with your last question. How, how do we measure the replication lag? So in Cockroach, if we have a three-region cluster uh, and we replicate the data three times, so we'll place one replica on in each region. So uh, uh, we, we break data up into ranges, which is you can think about it like a partition or a shard. Each one of those ranges is a certain size, and we replicate that. So uh, you know, across these different regions, you'll have you know thousands of ranges. Uh, but but each range will, will have one replica in in one of these nodes in one of these regions. So uh, when when you write to cockroach, um, you have to write to two of the three. So what you expect to see is I'm going to write to my local. If, if I'm if I'm in US East, I'm going to write to my local one, and then I'm going to kick off an asynchronous write to the other two. Whichever one is acknowledged first, um, then I can then I can say I've got quorum, and I, I can return control back and say that was a good write. So. So that part is, is part of the synchronous uh, write time. If that third replica takes a little bit longer, that, that happens asynchronously. We don't, we don't need that to finish. So, so the, there, there's not really this idea of, okay, I've got my synchronous time and I've got my replication lag. The replication is really taken care of as part of the write path. Make sense? Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a little bit on the second one. So. Uh, one of the things we do is is retry logic, right? So that's that's one that a lot of our a lot of our integrators, whether it's a terminal or whatever, they they can do that themselves. 
But by using that global IP address and using the global load balancer, we can now move that ret retry logic onto us, and we can we can perform that ourselves. And so um, that's been a little bit of a change the way the app works uh, in, in the legacy version. But yeah, it's been good from the modernized side. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Um, the question I've got is about uh, whether developers deal with app um, database sharding at all with Cockroach DB, um, and if not, what's the magic behind that? Right. Yeah, so w when you're talking to CockroachDB, you know, I mentioned there's multiple servers there. So we, we put a load balancer in front of that, and we say, you know, point, point your app to that load balancer. And that load balancer just round robins you between the nodes. And so there, there could be three nodes, there could be 30 nodes, your app doesn't really know. Uh, any of the nodes you talk to can read and write. So um, yeah, so as, as you write data into Cockroach, we, we, we'll take the data and we break it up in what we call ranges. Each range is about uh, 500 megs in size, so we don't we don't like shard based on a sharding key or a, any kind of like schema based thing. We just do it based on size, so we end up with with all these ranges of about the same size, and then we replicate those. So uh, Cockroach will will has a heuristic for kind of figuring out where to place those replicas. It tries to balance uh, space across all the nodes, and it tries to place. Um, things diversely, so if like some of the nodes are in AZ1, and some are in AZ2, and some are in AZ3, it'll try to put the replicas across the AZs. Um, so that just kind of happens automatically. So yeah, the, the, the developer, you're just doing select statements, update statements, you don't, you don't know how many nodes are there, you don't know how many ranges are there, you just know I can read and write. So that, that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sir. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for presentation. Uh, I had a question about uh, read your writes. So you said in Cockroach DB it's impossible for two requests sent to two different uh, regions uh, to read different data. So, but based on what you just described, how uh, synchronization works? How, how does the synchronization work? Uh, yeah, so and you said it's fully async in the quorum, right? Right, so right. How is it possible that two requests sent to different uh, regions still will see the same data? Right, that's a great question. So, yeah, so he was asking, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, two people reading the same record, if they, if they hit different regions, they're gonna see the same uh, results. So the, the way we do that, we take an uh, individual range, we replicate it of those three replicas. One of them gets elected as the leaseholder replica. Uh, and the other two we call follower replicas. So when you write, you have to write to the leaseholder uh, plus one of the other followers to, to get that quorum. And when you read, you have to talk to the leaseholder. Uh, so there, there's like a kind of a special replica, this leaseholder idea. So because when we write, you have to write to the leaseholder. And then when you read, you have to read from the leaseholder. Uh, we know that that data is going to be consistent. You're going to get the same result back. So that, that leaseholder, uh, there's nothing special about where the leaseholder ends up. Like if, if, you, if a node is hosting that leaseholder and that node goes down, Cockroach will just spin that leaseholder up somewhere else. So it's not like your app has to know about this leaseholder idea, but in Cockroach you do. So when you're running a multi-region, the placement of that leaseholder is important for latency, um, especially in multi-region. So we, we have a few um, configurations we can do to help with that. Um, uh, we have a thing called regional by row. We have a thing called global tables. So uh, I don't want to get too, too far down the rabbit hole, but i um, happy to talk to you about it. There's, uh, there's some configurations we can do to, to make sure we're minimizing latency. But that, that leaseholder idea is kind of the basic um, idea. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but it sounds like it's cross-region reads. Still, it, right? Yeah, it could be cross-region reads. So uh, it, it, yeah, so that like the, the global tables is an idea where you can uh, basically, uh, if you have some tables that you read from a lot, but you don't write to very often, you can, you can say that's going to be a global table, and it, could, it will make it to where you can read, for, read it from anywhere. So it's very really good for like lookup tables that you join to a lot, but they don't change very often. And then um, we have this idea of regional by row, where you can say, I've got these three regions. Uh, the data that comes to east is like I have a consistent way of routing it to the east. So I've got this customers table, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that the, the rows in that table that came in on the east, they stay on the east. And there is that came in on the west, they stay on the west. And so in that case, you, you know the leaseholders on the west stuff is in the west and the lease east is in the east. So you can kind of affect where the leaseholder placement is. So you, you, you hopefully minimize the, the, the need to go across a region. 
And uh, there's, a, there's a few other kind of techniques we have, but um, yeah, that's, you're, you're, you're on the right track with, you know, kind of, we want to kind of mi minimize latency uh, and still have the, the resiliency and availability of having multiple regions. So there, there's some trade-offs there. I see. Thank you. Yeah. All right. 16 seconds left. Anybody have a 16-second question?